Okay, let, anyway, let's look at the, the rest of those five examples. Well, this one, whether it's stable or instable. Uh, well, to check from the definition, we always first assume that the input is a bounded signal. Let's assume x of t less than b for all time t. Then let's look at whether the output is bounded or not. So we look at the absolute value of the modulus of y of t, which is this, and applying the, uh, the so-called triangular law, we can split this uh, absolute value of those modulus so that we can have each individual term less than b. So this is 100b, 101b. So 101b is also a constant because b is a constant. Therefore, y of t less than 101b for all time t, therefore y of t is also bounded. Satisfies the definition that if x t is bounded then y of t is bounded, then this is a stable system. For these two, let's put them together because they are very similar. So y of t, it depends on whether t is less than t0 or otherwise. If less than t0, then it's always 0. Larger than or equal to d0, it is the integral of x tau for tau from t0 up to time t. And the signal on the right has quite similar structure, but inside the integral is, there's additional exponential minus tau. So this additional term actually has a significant impact. It changes the instable system to a stable system. Uh, well, let's have a longer uh, first section today and we will make sure to have 15 minutes break and have a shorter second section. So to just to accomplish these examples for stability. Uh, again, we want to check whether y of t is bounded. And we can focus on time t larger than t0 because for t less than t0, y of t is constantly zero. Therefore, it's trivially bounded. And for the system on the left, we can actually, we can, it's enough for us to find a counterexample where x of t is bounded, but y of t is not. The counterexample is simple. Just assume x of t is some constant small b, which is positive. Therefore, x of t is of course bounded by any constant number capital B that's larger than small b. But for this bounded input x of t, if you look at output y of t, now we are taking the integral of a constant. For t larger than t0, it's just that the constant b itself multiplies the time difference t minus t0, which goes to infinity as t goes to infinity. Since it goes to infinity, the y of t is unbounded. So for a bounded input y of x of t, it leads to an unbounded output y of t. Therefore, the system on the left is not stable, it's instable. But for the system on the right, we can prove that it is stable. And to prove it, we must satisfy the definition. Therefore, the definition says we consider any x of b, x of t which is bounded, otherwise x of t less than b. Then for this kind of x, we can calculate the modulus of y of t, which is this integral. Uh, well, so y of t modulus outside, but if we move the modulus inside, so that's only for x of tau, then we have this less than or equal to this. And then x of tau modulus less than b because we assume it is bounded by some constant b. Since b is a constant, we can extract it outside of the integral. What is left in the integral is exponential minus tau. And we've learned how to calculate this integral. It's just exponential, exponential minus t, but don't forget there is additional 
negative size so that we need to flip the upper lower limit of the integral exponential minus t0 minus exponential minus t and we are looking at the case t larger than or equal to t0 therefore exponential minus t is less than or equal to exponential minus t0 therefore this term is less than capital b exponential minus t0 and this is a constant because t0 is constant capital b is a constant therefore for all time t the modulus of y of t is less than a constant. In other words, y of t is bounded. For any bounded input, we can obtain a bounded output satisfies the definition. Therefore, it is a stable system. Then let's look at the last two examples associated with continuous time stability. We look at the first one. Again, we can find a counter example to show that system is not stable. Still the same counterexample, x of t is constant small b, so that it's bounded. But the output y of t becomes 0.001 t times b. Although the coefficient 0, 0, 0.001 is very small, but the t here goes to positive infinity, it still makes y of t to infinity. Therefore, y of t is unbounded. This system is instable. For the second example, so our observation is that this sine sinusoidal function, although it has a very big coefficient of 1000, but its magnitude or its modulus never exceeds one. Therefore, we can bound the output y of t. If we assume x of t is a bounded input, then the modulus y of t is less than or equal to the multiplication of these two terms less than or equal to one times the modulus x or t, in other words, less than y, uh, less than b. Therefore, y of t is bounded. Bounded input leading to bounded output. Again, this is a stable system. Okay. Uh, let's stop here, have a five, uh, 15 minutes break. Uh, when we come back, we will uh, continue the study of stability property for discrete time system. The stability property can be extended from continuous time to discrete time system. The definition is quite the same, except we change that time index from continuous to discrete time. And for discrete time signal, the definition bounding is also uh, similar. So x of n modulus or absolute value less than some constant b for all n uh, again, this is a typo I will correct, or integer n, z, so not only positive integers, but also negative integers. Otherwise, x of n unbounded. Uh, for discrete time, I would just, we will just go through these two examples together. Uh, the first signal is y of n, which is a sum from a particular lower bound capital N to small n. Uh, here, this definition is incomplete because it's only, this sum is only well-defined for n larger than or equal to capital N. Uh, later, I will make it up uh, by making y of n equal to zero if n is less than n. But this does not affect our discussion about stability because if y of n equals constantly equal zero, that part of the signal is always bounded. For the uh, example on the right, uh, it's, it's, uh, this summation it has a lower limit, upper limit, both associated with n. So n minus n to n plus n. Again, n is a positive constant integer. So if we look at the difference between these two, for the first one, as small n, as the time small n goes to infinity, this can become a infinite sum. Therefore, if we consider this particular country example where x of m is constantly one, 
the act of m is bounded because it's bounded by any positive number that's larger than one. As n goes to positive infinity, we can calculate y of n as, f, because just replacing x of m with one, y of n just equals the number of i terms that we are adding together, which is small n minus capital N plus one. And this goes to positive infinity as small n goes to positive infinity. Therefore, x of n is unbounded. Again, we found a counter example where a bounded input leads to a unbounded output, so the system is instable. But it is a different case for the example on the right, because for, for this example, this is a finite sum. So no matter how small n changes, this summation only has two capital N plus one terms. Therefore, we can prove boundedness of the output in, uh, in the following way. We assume that the input is bounded. So this is just the definition of boundedness. Then the output is bounded by from the same lower limit to the upper limit, but replacing x modulus with capital B. It just equals capital B multiplies the number of terms of this summation from small n minus n to small n plus n, there are two capital N plus one terms. So capital N is a constant, capital B is a constant. So two n plus one multiplies B is still a constant. Y of small n is less than or equal to this constant that does not rely on small n. Therefore, it fits the definition of boundedness for Y. In other words, we proved bounded input leads to bounded output, so the system on the right-hand side is stable. That's the stability for discrete time system. Now, we've uh, learned four properties, memoryless, causal, invertible, and stable. The, there are two properties left. One is time invariant, one is uh, linear or linearity. So these two examples, I put them in, in the last because they are the most important. They are also connected to the next chapter, a linear time invariant systems. So uh, yeah, let's turn up for this, uh, for the study of these two properties. So time invariance. Well, intuitively a system is time invariant if its conversion from the input to output does not change over time. So what do I mean by the conversion does not change over time? Say we have an arbitrary input, let's use continuous time system for example. Say we have an arbitrary input x of t, which produces output y of t. Now we shift x of t over time. We've learned this time shift operation at the beginning of this lecture. So we shift it by t0, the x of t becomes x of t minus t0. If we input this shifted signal to the same system, then the output would be nothing but simply the shifted version of y of t. And then we shift it by the same amount t0. So if we input x of t minus t0, then the output is y of t minus t0. If this properties, this property holds for all the input signals x of t and for arbitrary shift amount t0. So t0 can be positive, which means we are shifting the input signal to the right, or it can be negative, which means we are shifting to the left. But this property always holds then this system is called a time invariant system. And the same definition for discrete time, just the change t to n, just the change the shift among t0 to integer n0. Uh, I always made this typo. So n0 should be integer z. It can be positive or negative. 
So let's, well, let's go through the first two examples. So vertically uh, arrange the first two examples are these two. We go, let's go through them together and we do the third one, the fourth one as exercises. Okay, already said yes, yes. Uh, but well, it turns out that the first one is time invariant, but the second one is not time invariant. If it does not satisfy the definition for time invariance, then it's called time variant. Let's see why. If you look at the first, the first system, well, it's a so-called time delay system. So no matter what xn is, the output yn is always uh, delaying x of n by three. So n minus three. If the input signal is x one of n equals, so what do I mean by this? We consider, so we want to check from the definition. So we want to, make the input a shifted version of original x of n. Let's make it shift by n zero. And this is a still a signal over time n. n zero is a constant. So since this is a signal, so we have a new notation x one of n just for convenience. We input this signal to the system. Let's see what is the output. We denote the output by y one of n. And this relationship between input and output always holds. So if we change the input to x1 of n, then the output y1 of n is x1 of n minus three. That's following this law. The law does not change. But what is x1 of n minus three? We need this definition because we denote x of n minus n zero as x1 of n. We replace this n with n minus three. We replace the right hand side n with the same n minus three. So this is the replacement written in terms of x. And we are rearrange this term in the square brackets. We put n minus n zero first together and minus three second. And what is this? If we compare this with the right hand side of this green equation, we are just replacing n with n minus zero. Because of this equality, we can replace the n on the left hand side with n minus n zero as well. So it becomes y of n minus n zero. So after all these derivations, it tells us that if the input is a shifted version by n zero of the original input, then the output is also a shifted version by the same n zero. This satisfies the definition of time invariance. Therefore, this system is time invariant system. But the second system is different. We play the same trick. We consider a shifted version of the input x of n, which is x of n minus n zero. For convenience, we use x one of n to denote this new input signal. Let's see what is the new output signal. The new output signal y one of n Again, according to this law on the left, it's x1 of 4n plus 1. Then replacing this n with 4n plus 1, we get its expression in terms of x. So it's x of 4n plus 1 minus n0. But what we want to compare it with is the shifted version of y n minus n, y n, y n minus n0. What is y n minus n0? We are going to refer to this equation characterizing input output relationship. We replace n with n minus n zero. We must replace the n on the right hand side with the same quantity. So we replace this n with n minus n zero. That's the result. We reorganize it a little bit. We put four n plus one together at the beginning. And what is left is minus four n zero. Therefore, if you compare this term, this term, they are not equal because this is n zero here, this is four n zero here. So the new, the shifted version of y n does not equal the new output y one of n. Therefore, it violates the definition of time invariance. In other words, this system is time variant. Now with this, uh, 
uh, understanding obtained from these two examples, let's practice with the third one, the fourth one, both on the first, on the left column. So I'm referring to these two. Yes, yes, okay. Okay, let's look at these two discrete time examples. The third one, it turns out that that's a time varying system. Uh, from the properties we learned above, one experience is that we can, to show that a system does not satisfy a certain property, it's very useful or very convenient to find just one country example. To tell time invariance or not, a common country example you, we use is this signal, delta of n, which we learned before. It's called the unit impulse signal. So if the input to this system x of n is this particular example, delta of n, then what is the output? So we use this relationship. Because delta of n has this structure, it is one at time zero, zero everywhere else. And the output equals the input at time n not zero, which is zero anyway. At time n equals zero, delta of n equals one, but y of n forces it to be zero. Therefore, the output is y of n equals zero for all n, which is integer. So this is n in z again. Now we consider shifted version of the input. Uh, because that's by definition. We consider shift the version of delta from n, uh, from delta of n to delta of n minus n zero. So what does delta of n minus n zero look like? For any n zero, let's assume since it's a shifted version, let's assume n zero is not zero. Then delta of n minus n zero is a signal which is zero everywhere except at the position n zero, it takes value one. Then if we input this signal to the system, the output becomes the following. For n equals n zero, which is not zero, y of n keeps x of n. In other words, it also returns the single impulse that takes value one. For n equals zero, y n equals zero, it does not matter because this shifting version of the impulse is zero anyway at n equals zero. Therefore, the output y of n, y1 of n is the same as the shifting input delta of n minus n zero. Now, if we compare the original output yn, which is constantly zero, and the new output y1 of n, which is a shifting impulse, we get the conclusion that the new output is not only the shift of the original output because it has additional impulse. Therefore, it violates the, uh, the definition of time inverse. It's a time varying system. For the last example, again, we are looking at a running sum. It is, we can prove that it is time invariant just by definition. Again, by definition, we consider a shifted version of the input x of n minus n zero. Then what is the output? So the new output y1 of n, still the running sum of x1 of m, where x1 is defined as the new signal, that's the shifted version. So we 
it doesn't matter if we use m or n. If we use x1 of m, we just replace n minus n0 with m minus n0. So here is a common technique that we will play uh, in, the, uh, in this term. We replace the integer time index. Let's uh, denote m minus n0 with this symbol k, which is an integer index. Therefore, when m goes to minus infinity, m minus n0, in other words, k, is also minus infinity. So we replace m equals minus infinity to k equals minus If m equals the upper limit n, then m minus n0 becomes n minus n0. So we replace this upper limit with n minus n0 because now we are looking at the upper limit in terms of k. And again, by this substitution, we can just replace m minus n0 inside the brackets with k itself. So what is this? If you compare this running sum with this running sum, it doesn't matter if we are using m or k as the index because it's just the index of the sum, summing terms. The only thing that matters is the upper bound. If the upper, the upper limit, if the upper limit is n, then the result is yn. In other words, if the upper limit is n minus n0, then the result is y n minus n0. So if the input is a shifted version x of n minus n0, the output is the same shifted version y n minus n0, satisfying the definition for time invariance. So this is a time invariance system. So we've, we've dealt with four examples for discrete time time uh, invariance property. Now we have those five examples on the right about continuous time, which has quite the same definition with discrete time. Therefore, let's try them. Let's first try, uh, try examples one and two in one minute. Okay, let's look at the first, first two. So it turns out that uh, neither of these two systems is time invariant. Both of them are time invariant. For the first one, of course, we can also try to find a counter example, but this one is relatively easier if you just show it directly from the definition. Again, we consider a time shifted version of input, which is denoted by x1 of t. y1 of t is x1 to minus t. That's because of this relationship, or in other words, because of this law of the system itself. x1 to minus t, just replacing t with 2 minus t, do the same thing on the right-hand side, which is this. Reorganize a little bit, so we put t and t0 together. Notice that this is t plus t0 in the brackets, in the small brackets. And we compare this again with the right hand side of this. We are replacing t with t plus t0. Coming to the left hand side, we are looking at a y t plus t0. But we are supposed to compare the new output with y t minus t0. So they are not equal. For this particular system, 
if we shift the input to the right hand side, the output is shifted to the left hand side by the same amount. They are not shifting in the same direction. So for this kind of system, it's still considered time varying. The next one, we have sine t times x of t. For this example, it's useful to, uh, to, to use to find a counter example. Again, x of t equals the unit in pulse delta of t. Let me remind you that unit in pulse is an arrow that has ideally infinite height, but the integral of this area under this arrow is one. And this impulse occurs at time t equals zero. This is the unit impulse. If x of t equals delta of t, what is y of t? y of t for t not equal zero, it's zero anyway, because input is zero, uh, because delta of t is zero at this time. For the particular time t equals zero, delta of t is an impulse, but this impulse is eliminated by this sign of zero, the sign of zero is zero. Zero multiplies anything is zero. Even if it multiplies in power, the result is still zero. Therefore, the, res the output is y constantly zero for all the time. Now we sh consider shifted version of x1 of t. But before we always say we change from delta of t to delta of t minus t zero, here we consider particular t zero, which is just a constant pi over two. This is the shifted version of this impulse. The impulse occurs at different location, which is t equals pi over two. That's the shifted version. Then the new output, still using this relationship. For t, which is not pi over two, the output is zero because the impulse itself is zero at these times. But for t equals pi over two, we have a impulse here, multiply sine pi over two. Sine pi over two is one. So in other words, we have impulse itself. To summarize, when the input is unit impulse, output is constant at zero. But if the input is shifted by pi over two, the output becomes an impulse that occurs at pi over two. Therefore, the output is not simply a shift of the original output. It violates the definition of time invariance, so this is a time varying system. For the, okay. Let's just go through these two examples, those two integrals together. So the, for the first one, this is a running integral up to time t, it is time invariant. Now we can use the same trick of substituting upper limit of integral, very similar to substituting the upper limit of the running sum for the discrete time case. Again, by definition, we consider a, a, a time shifted version of the input x of t minus t zero, denoted by x one of t. So the output is the running, ah, this is, should be minus infinity, uh, minus size missing here. This is a running, running integral of x1 of tau. x1 of tau is x of tau minus t0 by this notation. And we can change uh, d tau to d tau minus t0. But since we are changing this integral variable, we need to simultaneously change the upper lower limit of integral. Originally, we have the lower limit tau equals minus infinity. Since t0 is a constant, tau minus t0 is also minus infinity, so the lower limit does not change. What changes the upper limit? Originally, tau equals t, but now we are looking at this new integral variable tau minus t0, it becomes t minus t0. To make it more explicit, let's just substitute tau minus t0 with a single variable s. 
So s is our integral variable. It means s goes from minus infinity to t plus to t minus t zero. And if we compare this integral and this integral, it doesn't matter if we write tau or s inside the integral, because it's just an integral uh, index. But really, what really affects the result is the upper limit. When the upper limit is t, result is yt. When the upper limit is t minus t0, result is yt minus t0, which is a shifting version also by t0 unit. So this satisfies the definition of time invariance, a time invariance system. But if you look at the integral with the upper limit changing from t to 2t, it is no longer a time invariant system. To show that, again, we use the counter example with x of t equals the unit in pulse delta of t. So for, we take the integral of this unit in pulse. When t is less than zero, we are taking the integral of zero everywhere. So the result is zero. When t is larger than zero, this integral includes this impulse. And we've learned before that the area covered by this impulse is one. So the integral is one, which means if you look at the output yt, it is zero when t is less than zero. It is one when t is larger than zero. This is exactly the unit step signal we denoted by ut. Now we consider a shifted version of the input x1 of t, which is dot t minus one. Dot t minus one is the impulse that occurs at time one. Then what is the output? We still need the discussion at the upper limit equals one. In other words, t equals 0.5. If t is less than 0.5, then the integral upper limit is less than one. So we are taking the integral of a constantly zero signal. The result is zero. If t is larger than 0.5, which means the integral upper limit is larger than one, then this integral must include this impulse. And the integral jumps from zero to one. So a signal, output, an output signal which is zero before 0.5 and one after 0.5 is a shifted version of the unit impulse, which is u of t minus 0.5, which is y of t minus 0.5, because u, yt equals ut, so y minus. But we want to compare the output with y of t minus one, because we shift the input by one, we want to get the same shift of output by one. It turns out the output only shifts by 0.5. Therefore, it violates the definition of a time variance, time invariance, it's a time varying system. We had the last example, which is where the output is the derivative of the input over time t. So whether this is time invariant or not, uh, well, this case is a little bit special. So let, let me just show the answer to you and show the reason. This turns out to be a time invariant system. To prove that, let's again consider time shifted version as the new input x of t minus t zero. Then the new output is the time derivative of x one of t. For this proof, we turn to the original definition of time derivative. It's a limit, right? So we consider this function x of t taking values at t, taking values at t plus delta t, divided by delta t. And we let delta t goes to infinitely small, uh, approaches zero. The result, the limit is the, is the time derivative. And we can replace each of the term, we can write each of this term of x1 in terms of x of t minus t zero, just using this relationship. For example, here, x one of t plus delta t, then we just replace this t on the right-hand side with t plus delta t. So this is 
writing it in terms of x. Similarly, writing x one of t in terms of x, it just following this equation, just x of t minus t zero. And then we reorganize the first term a little bit so that t zero is put in the bracket and delta t is put outside. So what is this? So this is a standard definition for time derivative of function. But this time, the function we are taking derivative is x of t minus t zero. So we have dx t minus t zero dt. Now it's time for us to look at the original system. If this is dx dt at time t, then the output signal is yt. If we change the time index at time t minus t zero, then the corresponding change must also occur at the, on the left hand side. So we have y of t minus t zero. To summarize, if we shift the input by t zero, the output also shifts by t zero. According to the definition of time invariance, this is a time invariance system. Okay. So what we are left with is the last property, linearity. We still have time, so let's try to uh, look at some examples. Uh, of course, we look at the definition first. For a continuous time system, it is called a linear system if the following property is satisfied. The linearity property needs two pairs of inputs and inputs and outputs. And we consider two arbitrary pairs of input output. When the input is x1 over t, output is y1 over t. If the input is x2 over t, a different signal, then the output is y2 over t. Note that this x this, this inputs and outputs must be arbitrary to satisfy this linearity condition, uh, linearity definition. And also, let's assume we have arbitrary constants A and B. Then, if we have a new input signal, which is a linear combination of x1 and x2, it takes this form A times x1 plus B of x2. We put this new signal Know that this is also a signal of time t. Input this signal to the same system. The output, if it's the following, is the same linear combination of the output of the individual signals. Then, if this satisfies, this system is linear system. That's for continuous time. And the same definition for discrete time. The only change is from continuous time t to discrete time n that must be integer. This is definition of uh, linearity. Uh, so let's, uh, okay, let's use the time to look at the first two examples. Are the, these two systems, according to the definition, they are both linear. And the proof for their linearity, just straightforward from the definition. We consider two inputs, right? Because that's what's required by the definition. And for input x1 of t, the output is y1 of t, which is t times x1 of t, according to this relationship. But similarly, if we change the uh, subscript for input x2 of t, y2 of t, this. Now let's consider a new input x3 of t, which is a linear combination of x1, x2 of t, by arbitrary constant coefficients a and b. Then what is y3 of t? y3 of t, according to this input-output relationship, it must be t times x3 of t. That's because of this input-output relationship. Then, by the way that we construct this new input x3 of t, we can replace x3 of t with the linear combination of x1, x2. And this, we can break the brackets because of the linearity, or because of the, actually because of attributive uh, property of uh, multiplication. So we have at times x1 of t, bt times x2 of t. What is t times x1 of t? Looking back, we have y1 of t. So replace t times x1 of t with y1 of t. 
again, uh, similarly, t times x2 of t with y2 of t. So this is the linear combination of the original outputs. It's exactly what is required by the definition of linearity, so this system is linear. And the, similar tech, the same technique can be used to prove linearity of the second example. It's an integral with upper limit 2t. Again, we consider two inputs, and the two outputs are the integrals of the same form, but different subscripts. So two outputs are the integral of individual in, uh, of, of the two inputs respectively. Again, construct the new input as linear combination of the two inputs. The new output should be the same, should be the integral with the same upper limit, but with respect to the new input signal F3 of tau. But F3 of tau is this linear combination. And for anything inside the integral, we can break it and pull the constant coefficients outside of the integral. That's why we have A times this integral for x1 tau d tau, B times this integral for x2 d tau d tau. And these two integrals are respectively y1, y2. So we again have a y1 time plus b y2 satisfying the definition. Therefore, this system is linear. Uh, it's time, so we stop here. We will finish the linearity property and have a, a overall conclusion of chapter one in the Friday lecture. Uh, thanks for your attention. See you on Friday.